This is the Messiah Hour with Ari Lewis. All right, welcome everyone back to the Ari Lewis Show here on IsraelSportsNewsRadio.com. Thank you for joining us. We have a great segment coming up. If you'd like to email us at any time, you could do so at Ari Lewis Show at Hotmail.com, or you can email the station at IsraelSportsNewsRadio at Gmail.com. In my opinion, this is the best time in sports throughout the year. You have the NHL Finals went underway last night with the Chicago Blackhawks taking the Game 1 victory. NBA Finals set to happen tonight between, of course, LeBron James, the Cleveland Cavaliers, and the Golden State Warriors. All the line, discuss this back to the program. Mr. Doug Gottlieb. Doug, how are you doing out there? I'm well. I'm well. It's, it's great to have you on. And how excited are you because people have complained about the markets. It's not the biggest market. It's not New York, L.A., but it's the two best players in the NBA, according to most people, LeBron James and Steph Curry. So what are your thoughts about the matchup of star power, even though it's not the big market cities that we see many times in the NBA Finals? You know, honestly, I think the the old big market, small market thing really is uh, a conversation of the past because every game's on TV and the TV finds the stars. I mean, look at the, you know, the last year's MVP was Kevin Durant. Um, even when LeBron was in Miami, Miami's not a particularly big market per se. It's not New York, Chicago, LA, etc. Um, and so, you know, while while traditionally um, or historically, you've needed a big market to get a big number. That's that's kind of gone the way of the dodo, if you will, uh, with sports in the United States in 2015. You know, it's it's more about stars, and you have Steph Curry is the most popular athlete among millennials in uh, the country. That's it's crazy. And then you have the best basketball player in the world, which is LeBron James, um, who, for whatever reason, is this uh, kind of polarizing figure in that people kind of begrudgingly respect him, but many people still don't like him. Um, and uh, and so, you know, I, I think it, it makes for a fascinating series. Let's talk about the not liking LeBron James, uh, I feel like the guy gets a bad rap. You talk about most superstars at his level have a very big controversy. He stayed away. The only thing that really uh, uh, orcs fans was the whole decision, the way he left Cleveland. But he's back with Cleveland. He took it back to the NBA Finals. Cleveland's only been to two NBA Finals, both LeBron James. So what is your opinion of why the fans hate him so much, and is it justified their dislike of him? Well, I mean, I don't think he handled it perfectly when he left. He didn't need to do it in Greenwich, Connecticut. He could have, you know, done it in his hometown. He could have done it in Miami. You know, there's a, a million ways he, he could have done it, and he chose not to. And he did raise $2 million for charity. But, look, I mean, if you want to chalk it up to we've all left the company in the past and maybe not handled everything perfectly, some have handled it better than others. Um, it wasn't like Cleveland handled the fact that they were shunned all that well, you know. I I honestly think that it's a it's a sad snapshot of a little bit of American jealousy, and that instead of appreciating what he has learned, how he has grown, the fact that he plays to his strengths, not his weaknesses, instead we harp on the things we don't like. And, and some of it is kind of the classic. Well, he's just bigger, stronger, more athletic. He was supposed to be this good. And we, we try and pick apart the things we don't like more than the things that we do like and do respect. So um, I think that's more what it's about. It's just kind of these are very American problems that um, are, I think, kind of embarrassing to us. I don't think he's a perfect player, but I think he's um, far and away the best player in the NBA. It's not close. Um, and he's far more valuable in terms of true value than Seth Curry is. Um, and he may end up actually being the best player to ever play the game, though people will always fall back on Jordan. I was a Jordan guy growing up, and I'm still a Jordan guy per se, but what LeBron's doing is amazing. So I, I, I think a lot of it comes down to just um, the fact that he, he was arrogant when he was young, and he's still probably arrogant, um, but he does a better job of hiding it. And uh, we're jealous of somebody who's, arrogant and successful at a young age and is bigger, stronger, faster than everybody else. Instead, we like the underdog. 
Good point. That's pretty much sums it up uh, to the T again. This is the Ari Lewis Show here on Israel Sports and News Radio dot com. Being joined by Doug Gottlieb, talk about the NBA Finals. This matchup is going to feature two rookie coaches, as far as NBA rookie. Uh, you talk about uh, Steve Kerr. You talk about David Blatt. Of course, we know David Blatt from Israel. The NBA Finals many times is about matchups. How do you think these two first year coaches are going to handle this? Obviously, they have a wealth of basketball experience, but this is a whole new animal, and they're on the stage of the NBA Finals. How do you think each coach will handle the situation? Well, I think David Blatt's actually uh, really shown himself well so far in the playoffs, in that, you know, he, he had the snafu where he tried to call a timeout that they didn't have against the Bulls. Uh, some people would point to him trying to have LeBron take the ball on in bounds before LeBron hit a game winning shot against against the Bulls. I actually understood it because if you watched the game, they couldn't get the ball in bounds um, two consecutive times, three consecutive times. They had to call they had to call a couple timeouts just to get it in bounds on the very uh, previous play. Uh, but anyway, um, he has had a great relationship with LeBron. He's had to kind of prove himself all over again in the states, which I think is mostly unfair. Um, but, um, I thought he completely dismantled Atlanta with his game, his preparation and his adjustments. Uh, I thought they were magnificently coached. Um, how will he prepare? I mean, like, look, what you need to know is that Cleveland, if at full strength, I believe is the better team, but they're not at full strength. And while, uh, Kevin Love hasn't had the type of year that some expect him to have, and he struggled to kind of fit in with LeBron, this would be the series in which Kevin Love would be incredibly important because he could play the center position because Golden State likes to play small. Um, and he's a, he's, a, he's a bigger, better version of what Draymond Green does. And I think he would match up well with Andrew Bogut. And he could also play the power forward. So not having him is really going to hurt the Cavs. Not having a Kyrie Irving healthy is really going to hurt the Cavs. Um, on the other hand, Golden State likes to play small ball. Four small guys, sometimes five, five players where their, their tallest player is Harrison Barnes, but their big guy is really Draymond Green. And traditionally, that's not the way you beat LeBron because LeBron can play the four, LeBron can play the five. Um, I think the matchups are really interesting. You know, when, when Golden State goes big, I think Cleveland is their match. When Golden State goes small is when they play better basketball in the playoffs. Again, traditionally, that's when LeBron dominates. Uh, the problem is I, I just don't think he has the horses around him. Um, as for Steve Kerr, Kerr's done a great job. And I don't know if your guys broadcast get what we get, which is some of the mic'd up segments where you, you hear what he's talking about in the huddle. And he does a very good job of, if they're not playing well, pointing out they're not playing well, but doing so in a non-confrontational manner. Um and he's got a good feel for when to go to the bench. Um, he's got a pretty set substitution pattern, although he doesn't just kind of stick to it. He reads the game well. Their bench provides a lot more defense, uh, whereas their starters are a lot more offensive-minded. And then he seems to have had a good feel for when to go small and when to go big. So, I mean, so these have been the two dominant teams in the playoffs, Matt. You know, you talk about Cleveland losing a game or two days to Chicago. Uh, but outside of that, I mean, they, you know, both teams have been pushed a little bit, but they've had plenty of time to rest. And I think the one thing that really goes in those state favor is their health care. And I want to talk about Steve Kerr's path to get into this head coaching position with the Warriors. We in Israel knew David Blatt. If there was one guy that was going to make it to the NBA as a coach, it was going to be him, what he did with the Russian team, winning the bronze, when he did uh, the Euro Championship with the Cabo Tel Aviv and the Israeli Championships year after year. And Steve Kerr, second-round draft pick, and obviously U of A, you know, took him to the Final Four. Uh, he makes it in the NBA, wins five titles, a supporting cast role, Michael Jordan later on with the Spurs, becomes a general manager at one point of the Phoenix Suns, TNT analyst. You've been around basketball for a long time. Did everyone know at some point he was going to be a head coach? Just the way he understands his game, basketball IQ, his coaching brain, you can kind of see it already. Did everyone know at some point he, he would get to this level? Um, I, I did. Um, you know, I, I got a chance to work with Steve. You know, Turner and CBS, we do the NCAA tournament together. And I actually got to do a couple games with him. And I mean, you know, we all kind of have this passion for it. He's also a Southern California guy. I mean, I think the big question for Steve was going to be, you know, his family. And he has one kid who plays basketball in college, one kid who plays 
volleyball in college, and he made it apparent to everybody last year that he was ready. You know, his kids were out of the house. He was ready to go and, and get back into it, whether it was coaching or, or being a general manager. And um, so it, it, it didn't necessarily surprise me. What, what I think is, is the pleasant surprise is how much he's been willing to surround himself with really smart people. And, you know, his, the guy he wanted to hire as his top assistant was David Black. You know, so, I mean, and, and, you know, the guy he did hire was Alvin Gentry, who just got the Pelicans job. And um, I, I think it's the willingness to say, look, I know a lot about basketball, but I don't know everything. And I don't know everything about coaching, but he's played for um, three legendary coaches in the States, Lou Olson in college, uh, and then, you know, Phil Jackson. I mean, he played for a bunch of coaches in the NBA, but, you know, Phil Jackson and Greg Popovich, and, and their styles, both successful, are very, very different offensively and uh, philosophy-wise from each other. And um, I think, you know, when you're a smart enough guy, you pick up things that you learn along the way. Plus, he was a player, a cerebral, cerebral player at that. And then, you know, coaching in the States is uh, it's not just about X and O's. A lot of it is about, you know, manipulating egos and – manipulating the egos of agents and some of the supporting cast of some of these players. And I think because he had the respect of people, basketball IQ wise from, you know, being a TNT analyst and he's really good at it. And because he had been a general manager in which you deal with these people on a day-to-day basis, I'm, I'm not really that surprised really. I mean, but Golden State had talent. Mark Jackson just, I, I was a, a good basketball guy, but I didn't think was, um, nearly as clever in some of his offensive stuff. It was kind of more old school basketball where a lot more isolations, whereas this is a lot more ball and player movement. And, you know, the more times you move that ball side to side, the more chances you get to attack. And I think, you know, that's kind of that Spurs philosophy. And so whether it's from playing that way or analyzing it and seeing the trends in the league, he's been able to, to hop right in and not only not miss a beat with the Warriors who are a talented team, make them even better. And then maybe the most underrated part is he gets them to buy in defensively. And some of that's the personnel, but some of that is uh, the philosophy of how they don't allow people to space them out. They play five as one defensively. And I think that's the two, that's the thing that both of these coaches have been able to do that doesn't get discussed enough. We talk so much about stars and making shots, and blah, 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 blah. But the reason both these teams are here is they're the two best defensive teams in the league. And despite smaller lineups, Traditionally, they're able to rebound against other teams, and so I, I think that's that's coaching, and, and that's just coaching effort and coaching philosophy, and and also game plan. Again, this is the Ari Lewis Show here on IsraelSportsNewsRadio.com. Our guest is Doug Gottlieb, talk about the NBA Finals. Game one set to go underway tonight between Cleveland and Golden State. Uh, Doug, we talked about the stars, obviously Steph Curry, LeBron James, two best players in the NBA. Let's talk about the X factors in the series for both teams. Who's the guy that's going to be the difference maker, whether the team wins the NBA Finals or does not? Oh, I think for the Warriors, it is, um, it's Raymond Green. He's probably their most important player. And then for the Cavaliers, uh, well, there's a bunch of them. Um, I would probably say Tristan Thompson because he's going to play some center, some power forward. I mean, his rebounding and defense is really what's kind of changed for the Cavs in the playoffs. He just bought into this idea of trying to get every rebound and playing so hard. So I think those are the two. I mean, you could pick Matthew Delvadova, who's, you know, been a, a journeyman and, you know, made the NBA only a couple of years out of St. Mary's and, He'll have to guard staff. You could Kyrie Irving and his knee, and will he hold up? And can he guard anybody? And, um, you know, J.R. Smith and his shot selection. He'll make shots the way he has so far in the playoffs. But I think those two guys, Raymond Green and Tristan Thompson, are the two biggest best factors. All right, last question before we let you go. Uh, great matchup again set up to come tonight. Uh, what's your prediction? Who's going to win and how many games? Um, I think it's going to be the Warriors. And remember the. The NBA Finals have always has been for a long time the two three two, and this year it's going back to being two two one 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 like the rest of the series are. So that would mean to win in six games, the Warriors would have to win in Cleveland. Um, so I'm going to pick Golden State in seven, but I think Golden State wins the series. Uh, I'll take Golden State in seven, um, but I'm it could be Golden it could very easily be Golden State in five. I think they're much better considering a lack of health for the Cavs. 
All right, and it'll be an entertaining series nonetheless. So, of course, we appreciate everyone listening to the episode of R.E. Lewis Show here on IsraelSportsNewsRadio.com. My guest has been Doug Gottlieb. Doug, thank you so much. We know you're very busy. We really appreciate the time and enjoy the NBA Finals. All right, anytime, buddy. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Be well, and God bless. Shalom from Israel. Thanks, man. Call me anytime. All right, thanks so much. Be well. Yeah.